Nope. All right. So, the LLE, this is LLE number two this time. It is called radioactivity, and we're going to do a series of demonstrations of radioactive sources. Now, I could have picked radioactive sources from my uh, nuclear chemistry class that all look like this, plastic little contained sources that you might think are really scientific, but in reality, we have radioactive sources all around us, and so I thought I would choose some more common ones. Now, I'm going to start off with the guts of one of these. Now, I extracted this component from one of these. What's this? It's a smoke detector, right? Now, a smoke detector, most of them use radioactivity as a method for detecting smoke. And they do so by creating an electric signal in the ionized air, because remember, radioactivity emits ionizing radiation. So, here it is. Now I'm going to boost the scale up a little bit. Now, the source is, and I'm going to do this like, whoa, what happened? Hit the rotate button. Let's do it again. All right, zoom out. And maybe hit the lamp, if that helps. Not really. Eh, eh. Give me a second. All right, I want you to not have the glare. There. So, here is the source. There's the detector. Whoa, and the crowd goes wild. All right, so you'll notice This source of ionizing radiation doesn't travel through air very far, does it? Not only does it not travel through air very far, but I can take this sheet of paper and block most of it. Now, what source is that? That is americium, and I have no other place to write, so it's going to happen here. That's americium-241. Now, based on what you've already learned today, what should that be emitting? What? What kind? What kind is it? Look at this number. It's 95. What's the last stable isotope on the periodic table? 83. What are all the other ones unstable to? Oops. Alpha, beta, gamma. It's fat. Right? It's bigger than the last stable radioisotope, and the only way it's going to get on the weight loss program, other than fission, is by doing this little Jenny Craig alpha emission, right? If it emits an alpha, what did it become? What's this number? Yep, 93. What's this number? Right, 237 which is Neptunium, okay? That's an example of alpha emission. Alphas don't travel far because they're fairly heavy compared to the rest of the radioactive particles, and they're highly charged. This thing is actually a plus two charge. And so when it hits something that has electrons, it takes the electrons from it, it gets neutralized, now it's just a helium atom. 
Okay? As a matter of fact, all the helium atoms on our Earth that you blew up your helium balloons with at your last party came from a radioactive decay process. Probably uranium. Radioactively decaying. Okay. So, that's an alpha. Radioactivity can be blocked by a few sheets of paper. I have a beta source, just to show you a scientific beta source. This is strontium-90. Now, strontium-90, okay, in our scientific radioactive source, you can look at this real quick. This is what it looks like, okay? And it has a half-life of about 28 years. It's a beta emitter. And there's one-tenth of a microcurie there. None of that's all that important. Now, how's the paper doing? Not doing so well, is it? So now I have a quarter-inch thick sheet of plexiglass. Notice? All right. Betas are also charged particles, but they travel further, don't they? And they travel through more matter. Betas in terms of exposing you to ionizing radiation, would you think it would be more dangerous to be exposed to beta radiation or alpha radiation? Generally speaking, beta. There is a major exception. The second leading cause of lung cancer behind being stupid, we all know who we are. The second leading cause is what? It's an alpha emitter called radon. Radon is a gas. So if you breathe that alpha emitter, it turns out that those alpha particles can hit live tissue. Your dead skin cells on, the, on your hands, you know, will block alphas from penetrating your body and causing danger. But if you ingest or breathe an alpha emitter, it's, it can be extremely dangerous to you. Most alpha sources are not gases, the major exception being radon. All right, so that's a beta emitter. All right, gamma emitter. I have a gamma emitter here. This gamma emitter is a salt of uranium, okay, and it's called uranyl nitrate. It's obviously emitting through the bottle. I could open the lid. See it? I don't know, the color isn't all that good on the dock cam, but it's bright yellow. One of the interesting aspects of uranium is that Fiesta wear. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say Fiesta wear? Bright colored plates, cups, ceramic ones that have been glazed uh, yellow and orange. Um, the old ones were glazed with a uranium salt because of the brilliant colors it produces. Guess what else Fiesta Ware has associated with it? And it's radioactive. And so Fiesta wear is actually collected by people because they think it's cool, because it's radioactive. The new Fiesta wear that's sold and produced these days is not, is not glazed with uranium salts. All right, let's take a look and see how our paper does. Now I'm gonna reset this meter. All right, so. Yeah, so paper 
not doing us much good. How about the quarter inch thick sheet of plexiglass? It's doing it reasonably well, but to do a good job at stopping gammas, lead does a good job. And as a matter of fact, the more powerful the gamma emission, the thicker the lead has to be. Gamma photons are the most deeply penetrating forms of radiation. Reason being, they have no mass and they have no charge, so they're particles of light. They travel at the speed of light. And they don't interact much with matter. They're a lot like x-rays. So you can imagine x-rays penetrate your body, you get pictures of your bones, gamma rays would do the same thing. All right? So, that was that. Let's see. We have two unknown sources now. One is a lantern mantle for a Coleman lantern, one of those gas lanterns that you might have used camping. Okay, and I'll pull that out of there in a minute. Another is a watch that was a graduation gift from one of my colleague's parents to him. Uh, when he got his uh, degree in chemistry, they gave him a watch. <coughs> Lovely graduation gift. Once upon a time, the dials glowed in the dark. Bless you. But they weren't like the ones on my watch. My watch, yeah, it glows in the dark. It glows in the dark because it's phosphorescent, which means it gets shined up by the sun and glows for a long time. But if I left it in my uh, dresser for a couple days and took it out uh, in the dark, I wouldn't see it. This one originally uh, glowed, glue, glue, I don't know, without exposure to any light source. It had its own natural source. Guess what? Its natural source was ionizing radiation. Any ideas why you think he stopped wearing it? Let's take a look at the back. Yeah. And so, we will leave the watch there. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the ionizing radiation particles are. We're going to do a demonstration. The Geiger-Muller detector doesn't know what kind of particles it are, or they are. It just knows that it, there are some. So, two sheets of paper. <coughs> what do we know it isn't? Don't say it, think it. Okay, so the plastic is doing some good, but not really blocking it all the way. Couple of sheets of lead. Now finally doing a reasonable job of it. So, the watch face, what I want you to do is predict, okay, what type of ionizing radiation is being emitted. And by the way, this was not the whole watch face, but just the hands were painted with a radioactive paint. Now, you can't see radioactivity. So why did it glow? It glowed because the paint was also had a, had a fluorescent or a radio fluorescent dye in it. Um, like the Rutherford experiment that we talked about where the alpha particles went through the gold and then they hit this zinc oxide screen that fluoresced, this had that same thing. So it fluoresced due to the radioactivity exciting the fluorescent molecules. All right. One last one. The lantern mantle.
Now I have to adjust the scale. And again, get out the paper. What do you think? Hmm. That didn't seem to do much. Plastic? Paper or plastic? Plastic does... Huh? Somewhat reasonable job. Lead. Really good. All right. Obviously, oh, by the way, you should see this too. Back again. Here's the smoke detector. What would you expect plastic to do? Plastic does a pretty good job. Lead does a really good job too. Okay. So, now that we've seen that demo, I want you to hypothesize what the radioactivity is just what kind of emitter it is. Is it an alpha emitter, a beta emitter, a gamma emitter? Okay. And why you believe it to be so. Now you can also do a little background research in your conclusion and discussion section because you know that this was a watch. By the way, it was a Ben Roos, B-E-N-R-U-S watch. And uh, I don't think I have a date on it, but it's, uh, it's fairly old. I would say it's from the 50s, maybe. Um, and uh, the lantern mantle, I don't think I told you what the element was in the lantern mantle. But you can look up radioactive lantern mantles and find out what the, what the, why it's radioactive. And so you can do that in your discussion section and prove your hypothesis correct or incorrect based on our observation. That's a wrap for that.